Thank you for taking the time to listen to our weekly service. This is a listener-supported ministry, and we ask that you pray and see what God would have you give. Now let's get to our sermon for today. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, Lord, I thank you for this church. Thank you for the message we've already had. You told us to teach and admonish one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And now, Lord, we come to part two. I pray that you've been honored. God, I pray that you'd be honored by what's about to follow. May every heart here be receptive. Like a wide receiver on an NFL team today, Lord, may they be quick to catch whatever you want to throw to them today. Lord, help us to be hungry. And God, I thank you for this church, and I pray that as a result of our time together, that your people, your saints, would be encouraged to good works. And uh, Lord, just use these next few moments, please. In Jesus' name, I ask it because I know it's your will. Amen. Hey, grab your Bible, would you please? And I'd like you to turn with me to Philippians. And before I tell you what chapter, would you just allow me to take a few minutes and review with you why we have Philippians in the Bible? I know many of you know this, but it's always good to review. And and, uh, Philippians is so fun. I have committed this book to memory. I'm absolutely in love with it, and I know you are too. But folks, do you remember why we have Philippians? Remember what happened? Let me refresh your memory. Paul, the Apostle Paul, is on his second missionary journey. And he is camped out. He's ministering in a, in, in a city called Troas. And one night he had a vision. And in that vision, more or less, the person said, Paul, please come. Please come to Macedonia. People, that was absolutely earth shattering. Let me tell you why. The gospel had always been. A Middle East deal. Where Paul was at in Troas was Middle East. And in this vision, Macedonia is Europe. And it's through this vision, God is telling Paul, hey, I want you to bring the gospel to Europe. And every one of you ought to be thankful for that because every one of you are kind of a European. The gospel went to the Europe. And Paul obeyed that, obeyed that, that, that vision, if you'll know, and, and, and he, he went sailing a boat and he went up to Macedonia and he made a beeline to one of the most prominent cities in Macedonia. It was a cultural center. That city was called Philippi. Paul's custom was always to make a beeline for the synagogue because he was always given a platform in the synagogue. However, we have a problem. There was no synagogue in Philippi. So Paul heard about a Bible study, such as it was, of some devout Jewish women who met down by the river when Jews do not have a synagogue, when they don't have their temple, they like to meet by water because whenever anybody converts to Judaism, they would baptize them. These women met down by the river and Paul made a a beeline. And if you could just picture this in your mind, people, can you imagine? Here's a ladies Bible study going on. Here shows up this little Jew. Hi, ladies. Can I take it today? And evidently they said, okay. And Paul preached to them, folks, the gospel. Told them about the Lord Jesus Christ and how they could know for sure they were going to heaven. How they could know for sure that their sins were forgiven for his name's sake. And a whole gob of them, people, got saved. Would have loved to have been there. One of which was a woman by the name of Lydia. Lydia was a businesswoman, rather successful evidently, because we're told that the church at Philippi met at her house. Evidently, she was a woman of means. Well, Paul was there. We're not quite sure how long. And, and God richly blessed his ministry. And, and men got saved, people, because Philippians is written to the bishops and deacons at the church of Philippi. So, so men, maybe some of the husbands, and, and, and uh, God, the people got saved. And, and a great church got established. And, and after a process of time, Paul left. And, and, and this thriving church was there. And, and people, it really was thriving because over and over again, they kept Sending gifts to Paul to support his ministry. After about 15 years, word got back to that church that their beloved Apostle Paul was a Roman prisoner. That scared them. Their beloved Paul, their church planter, led many of them to the Lord. 
is now a prisoner of Nero. He was kind of a kook, was Nero. And they heard about this, and, and, and they were worried, folks. They were worried about two things. What's going to happen to our beloved Paul? And because, folks, the number one spokesman for Christianity to the European, the European countries was now a prisoner. What's going to happen to Paul? And they were also worried, people, and I hope you can appreciate this this morning. I hope you'd be the same way if you'd have been there. They were worried. What's going to happen to the gospel? It was brand new. Perceived by most as a cult, small little cult called Christians. And, and the word Christian originally was derogatory. It meant little Christ. They keep talking about Christ, 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 little Christ. What's going to happen to the gospel? The number one spokesman's now a, a prisoner. And, and what's going to happen to this? And evidently, people, one Sunday morning, they got up and said, uh, could we get a volunteer to go to Rome and check on Paul? People. That's 700 miles by foot. Could we have a volunteer? And they got one. What a man. His name was Epaphroditus. What a cool name. Time out. Girls, ladies of childbearing qualification, could I just suggest... The next child you have, if it's a boy, don't do this to a girl, but if it's a boy, would you name it Epaphroditus? I think that would be the coolest name ever. I've never met an Epaphroditus. We could call him Tuss. We could call him Di. We could call him Epa, whatever you'd like. But I would love to meet an Epaphroditus. What a cool name. <laughs> do I have any volunteers? No. Um, Epaphroditus raised his hand and said, uh, I'll go. I'll go. What a man. And he went. And he went there to Rome and, and ministered to Paul for, for we don't know how long, but for quite a while. And it was such a blessing to Paul. But people, let me tell you what Epaphroditus found out. Epaphroditus found out that Paul really wasn't in a prison. Oh yeah, he was a prisoner, but he, and the Roman government would allow this for special prisoners. He was allowed to have his own rented house. He was chained 24-7 to a guard. But he was allowed to have visitors. He was allowed to have his own house. Epaphroditus got there. That's what he found. Now, folks, after Epaphroditus was there for a while, Paul sent Epaphroditus back to Philippi carrying that very precious cargo that you and I know to be Philippians. And in the book of Philippians, and I want you to hear me, when you start reading chapter 1, immediately after introductory remarks, immediately Paul addresses their two concerns. Let me tell you what he says. He says, people, don't worry about me. I'm right in the middle of God's will. I'm right where God wants me. And folks, that was so significant because there were detractors out there that were saying, Oh, that Paul, he's in prison because it's God's judgment on his life. Because what he's been saying about Judaism. And Paul's saying, uh, No, I'm right in the middle of God's will. I'm right where he wants me. Please don't worry about me. He gives us that famous verse 12 of chapter 1 where he says, The things that have happened to me have rather happened rather under the furtherance of the gospel. I'm right in the middle of God's will. Please pray for my release. <laughs> Love to see you again. But I'm right in the middle of God's will. Never does he call himself, people, and many of you know this. Never does Paul call himself a prisoner of Rome. He always refers to himself as a prisoner of Jesus Christ. That's cool. And then he says, about your second worry. He said, let me tell you about the gospel. And ladies and gentlemen of Hartford, I get goose pimples every time I preach this. Let me tell you about the gospel. There is a revival going on. In the Roman government. <laughs> a revival. In fact, tradition says, people, that Nero's wife was a Christian. There's a revival going on. In fact, in chapter 4, he says, those of Caesar's household say, hi, hi. See, Nero's surrounded by believers. There was a revival going on. Why? What happened? I'm glad you asked. Picture this, would you? Paul 
is chained to a Roman guard. When you read chapter 1 and you look in the Greek, you realize that that Roman guard was a Praetorian guard. Let me tell you about those dudes. The Praetorian guard people was to the Roman army what Navy SEALs are to our military. They were elite. There weren't many of them. Caesar started in himself. They were, they were special detailed soldiers to protect him. Rome had all kinds of Praetorian guards. Historians tell us that when a Praetorian guard was chained to a prisoner like Paul, they would be chained in six-hour increments, which means that there were four different soldiers chained to Paul in the process of a day. Paul had nothing personal. Historians tell us that chain was probably 18 inches long. Paul is chained to one of these soldiers 24-7. There was absolutely nothing personal. Would you think about that for a moment? Nothing personal. Those soldiers saw everything. Paul's an apostle. In order to be an apostle, he had to be able to do miracles. Did those soldiers see miracles? I don't know. All I know is they saw everything, they heard everything, and people... Think about this, would you please? I hope you enjoy the humor of this. It's one thing to be chained to a soldier. It's an entirely different puppy to be chained to the Apostle Paul. Who is chained to who, really? Can you imagine being unsaved and chained to Paul? A whole gob of them got saved. I wonder, people, I wonder. Let me just play with something for a second. I wonder how many people would get saved if they were chained to you. Saw everything. And may I remind you that all of you are chained. All of you are. You're chained to something. You're chained to a desk. You're chained to children. You're chained to a school. You're chained to a job. You're chained to a neighborhood. God's got you right where He wants you. Why? Mm, To make money. No. That's a perk. He's got you there so that you too can cause a revival. And Paul says, there's a revival. Don't you worry about the gospel. And Farmington Avenue Baptist Church, don't you worry about the gospel. It's powerful. You ought to delight in it. You don't need to marry it to rock and roll. You don't need to marry it to celebrities. It does fine all by itself. You just be faithful with it. That would have been a good place to say amen, deacons. And then, people, you come to chapter 1, verse 27. Would you turn there with me, please? Verse number 27. And uh, if you have a King James Bible here this morning, I'd like you to do something for me. When I count to three, I would like you out loud with your golden, golden New England accented voices. With your golden New England Patriot Tom Brady loving voices, I would like you to give me the very first word of verse number 27. Are you ready? You ready? One, two, three. That was good, people. That was very good. Better than I expected. Only (laughs) Christians. What a word. What a word. Very significant. Let me tell you what Paul's doing to you. Paul is, uh, he, he's kind of saying, uh, Paul by that word only kind of means what, what you wives do when you're trying to get your husband's attention and he's on the internet or watching a football game. Hey! Why don't you catch this? Kind of what you parents do and, and you're trying to get your teenager's attention. Hey! Look at me! Paul's doing that to you, Christian. He's saying, hey! Why don't you guess this? It's like he's saying this, people. I've given you all kinds of background information. I've given you all kinds of information about the gospel. But I really, church, want you to catch this. This is really important. And what is it? Well, let's read on. Verse 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh. The gospel of Christ, please look at me, look at me, look at me. Ladies and gentlemen of Hartford, I promise you, when Paul used that word conversation, 
It rang their Philippian bells. Let me tell you why. Philippi, people, was a very unique city. There were hundreds of thousands of cities in the Roman Empire. There were only about 200 that were like Philippi. Philippi was what historians called a Roman colony. Would you say that out loud, please? A Oh, what a special city. Let me tell you what a Roman colony is. Now, I know who I'm looking at. I'm looking at people who live in Connecticut. And when I say colony, you immediately in your mind think, ah, I know what that is all about. I mean, colony, pioneers, shoe buckles, muskets, log cabins. Turkeys, I know all about colonies. New Englanders, you're being unfair. The word colony, the word colony does not mean what you think it means. Do you remember the first hundred years of our country? The first 100 years of our country plus, we were very loyal to England. We lovingly and happily paid our taxes. We said nothing but good about the queen and the king of England. We were an extension of England. And when people came to the United States of America before it was called that, when they came to this country, they thought they were coming to a piece of England. And they were. We were under English law. All of you spoke with an English accent. This was a piece of England away from England. Folks, that's what a Roman colony was. It was a piece of Rome away from Rome. Let's say, what's the big deal about that? Oh, it's a huge deal, people. Let me tell you why. If you are a Roman citizen, if you were born in Philippi, you were a Roman citizen. And if you were a Roman citizen, catch this, catch this, catch this. You enjoyed privileges. Privileges. There were laws. Didn't apply to you. There were taxes. You didn't have to pay. There were tolls. You didn't have to pay. You were very privileged. Ladies and gentlemen, do you understand that word privileged? Have you ever personally enjoyed any privileges? Could I be somewhat open and tell you about a privilege that I enjoy all the time? I'm not better than anybody. Please don't get that impression. But I understand this privilege thing. Let me tell you about me. I'm an evangelist. And I really, really appreciate your pastor letting me come. But as an evangelist, I always fly. I don't travel with a team. I don't travel with a fifth wheeler. I find it far more easy. That's why I stay so young. And, uh, but I fly a lot. And I always fly Delta. I fly Delta because I'm one of their platinum members of their frequent flyer club. You say, ooh, well, it is ooh. Be quiet. Let me tell you why. Let me tell you what happens. I will be, you know what, I'm going to use, can I, can I, am I okay moving this mic, Jim? We okay? Jim's also looking at me like I'm bald. Um, okay, I am, um, let me tell you what happens, people. I will, I will be, I will be at the airport. I'll be sitting there. And all of a sudden, I'll hear over the loudspeaker system, would Mike Schrock please come to the desk? I sure will. I know what's about to happen. I get up there and the lady says, oh, Mr. Schrock, and I know a lot of them by name. Oh, Mr. Schrock, can I have your ticket? You sure can. She takes that ticket and goes and hands me a new ticket. I have just been upgraded to first class. I know you're sitting there thinking, well, ooh, well, it is an ooh. Be quiet. Let me tell you why. Let me tell you what happens when you fly first class, in case you've never experienced this before. What happens when you fly first class is you get to get on the airplane first. Ooh. Well, it is an ooh because you have first dibs at all the overhead compartment space. And I always travel heavy. I have a trumpet in one hand. I have a huge briefcase with my laptop and hair products in another one. And I get on that airplane and I get first dibs. And I, I get up there and all oh, people, it gets better. 
It gets better. I sit down in a seat, but it's not a normal seat. It's a big, cushy, sulfa-type seat. And I sit down and sink into that pillowy cushion. And no sooner do I sink down when, blam, there's a steward in my face. Mr. Schrock, what would you like to drink? I think I'll have a fresca on the rocks. Thank you. I'll get that for you. And he runs, she runs to her little kitchenette. She comes back, he comes back with a, and I just sit there sipping my fresca in my sofa chair while all you peons walk right by me going back to your sardine seat. Amen? Yeah. I know what that's like. I do it all the time. But every now and then, I enjoy a privilege. You've got it. Can you imagine a whole lifetime like that? That's what it was like to be a Roman citizen. And when Paul used that word conversation, folks, let me tell you what that word conversation means. We get our word, we get our word politics from the word used there for conversation. The word conversation simply just means, and when we talk about politics, Hartfordians, when we talk about politics, what are we talking about? The way we govern ourselves as a people, who we elect, how we conduct our citizenship. Are you with me? Oh, they knew all about that word in Philippi. And when they read that word in Philippians, oh, I guarantee you, oh yeah, I know what that's all about. But what's the point Paul's making? Well, would you just take your Bible and turn one page to chapter 3 and verse 20? Look what he says. You see that exact same word again. Chapter 3, verse 20. Everybody turn there. I'm going to preach for two hours. Verse 20. For our, what church? Conversation is in, say it, heaven. What a privilege. I don't know how many of you are really saved. But if you are, you are a citizen of heaven. What a privilege. When you pray. God hears you. You've got a special connection. You've got reservation. You are most unique. What a privilege. And Paul is saying here in verse number 27 of chapter 1, if you want to turn back there, he says, Oh, Christians in Philippi, only let, catch this now, catch this, only let your citizenship, your conversation be as it's what people, what's the next word? Becometh. Becometh. Would you look at me? God wants every one of you to be becoming. Do you know what it means to be becoming? My little wife is here this morning. I'm so glad. And let me tell you about our marriage. We've been married for 34 years. And my little wife has learned a whole lot about me. And one of the things she has learned about me is that I'm fairly good, maybe not as good as some of you, but I'm fairly good with color. I like to match things. I like color. I'm not one of these, but I like, I like color. And, uh, and, and she has learned that I'm, I'm pretty good at it. And maybe, again, maybe not as good as some of you, but definitely better than some of you. Trust me. And, and, uh, but I'm, I'm pretty good with color. And, and so all the time in our marriage, she'll come to me and she'll say, Michael, do you think these earrings go with this top? Michael, do you think I should wear beige shoes or navy blue shoes with this outfit? Michael, do you think this skirt goes with this blouse? She's asking me my opinion. And quite frankly, I like it. So don't talk to her and say anything. I like it. Well, folks, why does she do that? Why? Because just like most of you, she's about to go out in public and she wants to look right. Did you hear me, Christian? She wants to look right. Young people, are you listening? She wants to look right. She wants to be becoming. And what Paul is saying is, oh, church of Philippi, oh, Christians of New England, it's good to know about the gospel. It's good to know about Paul and being a prisoner. But I really want you to catch this. Do you look right? Do you look right? People get so bent out of shape anymore in America. Well, how you tell by my dress and mm, 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 mm. I'm just quoting Paul. You need to look right. Christians have a certain look. Amen, deacons. 
Christians have a certain look. And, and, and Paul is saying, do you, do you look right? Well, people, what are you supposed to look like? Well, what does he say in verse 12, 27? Finish the phrase. He says, only, catch this, let your citizenship, your conversation, be as it becometh, you look right, according to the gospel. What? 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 The gospel. What is the gospel, people? I'm going to quote a verse. I think it's one of the most gorgeous little verses in the entire Bible that perfectly describe the gospel. It was written by an apostle who is called the Apostle of Love. His name was John. And John said in 1 John chapter 2 and verse number 12, I write unto you God's offspring. He uses the term offspring. There's little children in the King James. I write unto you little children, God's offspring, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. There's the gospel, people, in a nutshell. I sit here this morning. I stand here this morning. You sit there this morning knowing. I'm forgiven. Oh, I'm a loser. There's no question. I'm a sinner. I'm a jerk. But I'm forgiven. And may I remind you New England Christians, that is what makes you different from every other religion in the universe. You know your sins are forgiven. You know. I have a tennis partner. He's as unsaved as a skunk. And he's Jewish. And he and I get into it all the time. And I will say to him, Barry, how do you know your sins are forgiven? End of argument. Never has an answer. Except he said this one time, well, I'm not sure I have any sins. Are you serious, Barry? Come on. Come on. Folks, we know our sins are forgiven. So how are you becoming? You claim to be forgiven of sin? My friend, if you do, I know something about you. You hate it. You hate sin. Every true believer does. I hate my sin. And you're just like Paul who said, who will deliver me from this flesh? It keeps wanting to sin and I hate that. I hate it. Every genuine believer does. We hate sin. How do you look right? Having victory over sin. You're all about having victory over sin. One of your favorite songs is, Oh, victory in Jesus. Why did you write that song? Because we're all about having victory over sin. I want victory over sin. But friends, let me tell you what the problem is. A couple of years ago, I was doing a revival in Chicago. Your pastor lived in Chicago until he was in ninth grade, so I think he'll understand this illustration better than some. But I was in Chicago. I was doing a revival there at a church, and, 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 and Tuesday came, and, and the pastor took me out to lunch, and, and he took me to one of those restaurants, and I think all of you are familiar with them. It was a restaurant where there were flat-screen TVs all over the walls. Perfect place to go to when you wanted to watch college football on Saturday. It's a great restaurant, good food. But it was Tuesday, lunch. Nothing's on. Well, the maitre d' took us to a table and sat us here at this table. And about from me to that pulpit chair right there, platform chair, was a massive 70 inch, 90 inch, and 1,300 inch, or whatever, and flat screen TV. And on that TV, they had the volume way down, but they were showing music videos. And I just kind of ignored it. You couldn't really hear it. And, and we were, you know, doing our thing, talking and waiting. To, you know, and, and all of a sudden, on that flat screen, and Pastor, I want to be tactful. But on that flat screen came a young lady. If I said her name, every one of you, even you old people, would recognize it. This young lady came out there. She's very, very, very popular. Has a home in Rhode Island. Very popular. She came out there, and she started singing and moving and wearing an outfit that was all about sensuality, sexy. If I were to describe her outfit, or you folks, I, I know I'm selling ice to Eskimos right now. You know exactly what I'm talking about. And she started moving in that video in a way that was incredibly offensive to a man who wants to keep his thought life right and biblical. 
It was so offensive, folks, that I had to. And may I just add this, and this is going to make some of you crybabies mad. But let me just tell you something about her. She was only moving in a way that's dictated by her music. Some of you need to grow up and realize that music always has a message, even without words. And she was just moving in a way that's dictated. She had no choice, dictated by her music. Well, folks, it was so offensive, I had to turn in my booth and talk to the pastor out of the corner of my eye. But the reason I share that illustration with you, and let me drive this home. The reason I share that illustration with you is because I know something about that young lady. I've read quite a bit about her because she's always in the media. I've read that she claims to be a Christian. In fact, I read an article not long ago that said that she was... Considering getting out of the rock and roll genre and going completely gospel. My prayer, and this is going to offend some of you, but I'm going to say it anyway. My prayer is that she never does. We don't need more disease like that in Christianity. That woman claims to be saved. Now, people, I don't know how well you know this book. But if you've studied it like I have, you'll quickly realize... It says over and over and over again, flee fornication, flee sensuality, flee sexiness. But that young lady who claims to be a Christian is telling me, no, Mike, don't flee it. Chase it. Think about it. Meditate on it. Dwell on it. Ladies and gentlemen, that young lady although she's beautiful on the outside, is as ugly as she can be as a Christian. She is what Solomon describes as a diamond in a pig's snout. That is so, that is so, folks, and do you hear me? That is so what Paul was worried about. Don't let that happen. That's not becoming to the gospel. That's opposite of the gospel. And I hope you're catching this, believers. Paul's saying, oh, church, get this. Oh, it's good to know about the gospel. It's good to sing about the gospel. You keep doing that. But the big deal is do you live it? Do you look right? And I will close with this. Pastor, can I take a few more minutes? Would that be okay? The rest of you teenagers, would that be okay? Do you nod your head? Yes, your daddy's going to buy you ice cream on the way home. Is that okay? What does that look like, people? What does a good-looking Christian look like? I'm glad you asked! Look at verse 27. Look what it says, all right? Give me me a few more months and I'll be done. Verse 27. Only let your conversation, catch this now, only let your conversation, your lifestyle, your citizenship be as it, as it becometh looks good to the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may, what? Hear. Before I read on, I'm going to insert this free. Every one of you who claim to be a Christian have a reputation. I don't care. I don't care what you think. Every one of you have a reputation that people hear about. That's just the way it is. There's nothing you can do about it. You've got a reputation. Even you children. The book of Proverbs says a child is known by his works, whether he be good or whether he be evil. Every one of you have a reputation. This church has a reputation because of you. And Paul is saying that I may hear of your reputation, your affairs, back to verse 27. And what does he want to hear? That ye stand fast in one spirit. Oh, folks, would you look at me? One spirit. You know what that means? Farmington Avenue Baptist Church. God loves it when you get along. He loves it when you get along with each other. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever worked in a nursery? What would a nursery of one-year-olds, two-year-olds be like if there was no adult supervision? What would they be like? It'd be murder. And what, those of you that are mamas, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And daddy, it'd be mass murder. They're the meanest little things on earth. 
Mm, you show me a church that doesn't get along, I'll show you a nursery. Immature Christians. God loves it when his people get along. And he wants you unified in one thing in this verse. And what is that? Stand fast. Stand fast. Can I ask you a question? How many of you men and women in this auditorium are veterans? Would you raise your hand? I know, Dave, you're, you're a veteran. Anybody else? Any veterans? Okay, I see, I see a number. Okay, a woman. Very rarely do I see that. Thank you for your service. Men, thank you for your service. But those of you that just raised your hand, you're going to love this word. It's military. The word stand fast is military. How many of you are saved? Oh, a few of you. Good. Amen. You're going to love this word too because you know why? You're military too. You're a soldier of Jesus Christ. Read 2 Timothy 2. You're a soldier of Jesus Christ. You're going to love this term. The word stand fast is military. You know what it means? Basically, stay in your foxhole. Don't move. Stay in your foxhole. Stay where you've been assigned. Stay where God has put you. Stay true to your convictions. Don't move. Don't budge in what you believe. God has given you your marching orders. God has dug you a foxhole. Stay in it. I don't care what's politically correct. I don't care what other churches are doing. Stay in your foxhole. Pastor Sweat, it's so good to come to a church and there's still no drum set on the platform. <laughs> yeah. Group hug. Yeah. Thank you for standing fast in music. I know some of you crybabies are trying to pressure him to, to, you need to shut up. Stay in your foxhole. Why would anybody leave their foxhole, people? Why? Afraid. Afraid to take a stand. Stay in your foxhole, church. Stay in your foxhole about your convictions. What is the Bible? What has God told you to do? Don't budge. When you budge, you don't look right. You're kind of ugly. Stay true to your convictions. Folks, I am not. I am not a big Duck Dynasty fan. It's big down south. I'm not a big Duck Dynasty fan. However, there is a character on that program by the name of Phil Robertson. Are you familiar with him? He was the starting quarterback, by the way, for Eastern Louisiana State, and Terry Bradshaw was his backup. Anyway, that was free. Phil Robertson and that whole Robertson clan there, people, claims to be a Christian. Now, their, their, their theology, especially when it comes to the gifts, is a little wacky. But they really are outspoken about their faith and about the Lord Jesus Christ and about forgiving of sin. And they're, they're, they're saved. But let me tell you what happened. Phil Robertson, on a national media platform, I wonder how many of you men and how many of you women would have the guts that Phil Robertson had. On a national platform, he said, when asked, Hey, Phil, how do you feel about homosexuality? And they were baiting him. How do you feel? And Phil Robertson stood in national media, and here's what he said. Well, the Bible says it's sin. God says it's wrong. Therefore, it is wrong. The media. I mean, they had a temper tantrum. Do you remember this? It was only about two years ago. And so the network said, get off TV. For about two hours. And in that two hours, a whole gob of people spoke up and said, hey, uh, wait a minute. We like that program. Put it back on. And they did. I think that was God's reward, by the way, for a stand. Put it back on. Ladies and gentlemen, how many of you would stay in your foxhole like Phil Robertson did? Phil Robertson is gorgeous. 
very becoming to the gospel of Christ. Paul says, this is the most significant thing, Christian, you can deal with. Yes, I'm glad you know about the gospel. Yes, I'm glad that you know about Paul. Yes, I'm glad you know the Bible. But are you becoming? Do you look right? Would you bow your heads, please, and close your eyes? We pray that we have been a blessing to you. For further assistance, call us at 864-270-1472 anytime. Send email to info at stlmm.org or visit our website at www.stlmm.org. Like any ministry, it costs money to operate. Please consider supporting this ministry as God leads you with your prayers and your financial gifts by going to www.stlmm.org and clicking on Donations.